Have you ever asked this question? <laughs> Amen, right? Like, I look around the world, and I see hurricanes, and I see flooding and fires, and I see people starving, and we see all the pain, and we see all the turmoil going around, and sometimes it's really easy to say, why? Why, God? Or why so-and-so, or blame this person, or blame that person, or why don't things happen this way? Or God, how come things are happening in this way? Because I actually have a better way. I think you could handle it, Lord. <laughs> right? We don't say that out loud, but as we'll see in this story in just a minute, we do say it, and it's nothing new. So if you've ever had those days where you're just looking at it from all sides and you, you're just surrounded and it just makes you just ask that question, why all the pain, why all the suffering? You know, just online this week I saw people asking the question, is this God being angry? Is this God's judgment? Is it his divine wrath being poured out? You know, where, where is God in all this turmoil? And sometimes I, I wonder if we could pull back and see things from a, a godly viewpoint of 30,000 feet, we might see things a little differently. Sometimes I think things we see are not as they really are. We perceive things, and then we learn more information. We're like, ooh, <laughs> I was way off. Sometimes things are not as they seem. Years ago, you may remember that true story. It's hilarious to me going around. Uh, it's perfect for today's scripture. The story reads, there I was making my way, flying from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And by the time we took off, there had been an agonizing 45-minute delay. <laughs> 45 whole minutes, right? I know. First world problem. This delay was bad. Everybody was now in a bad mood. Unexpectedly, we stopped now in Sacramento on the way, and the flight attendant explained there would be yet another 45-minute delay, if not an hour. And if we wanted to get off the plane and stretch our legs, we could reboard in 30 minutes. Everybody got off the plane. That is, except for one gentleman who was blind. I noticed him as I walked by, and I could tell that he had flown before because his seeing eye dog lay quietly underneath the seats in front of him throughout the entire flight. I could also tell that he had flown this very flight because everybody knew him by name, and the pilot included walked by him, called him by name, and said, hey, Keith, we're in Sacramento for almost an hour. Would you like to get off and stretch your legs? To which Keith replied, no, thank you, sir, but maybe my dog would like to stretch his legs. Now picture this. Every single person in the gate area came to a complete standstill when they looked up and saw the pilot walk <laughs> off the plane with a seeing eye dog, wearing sunglasses, <laughs> no less. Witnesses say, true story, that not only did they try to change flights, they tried to change airlines. They <laughs> said, we're not doing this, right? Things are not always as they seem. And that is such a great reminder for us today. When we look around at the world today, Perhaps there's some things going on in your world where you're just scratching your head and you're going, I just don't get it. Lord, what are you doing? Or Lord, what is your timing in all this? Lord, where are you in all this? Sometimes you're going to have the answer. But I also want to be honest and say sometimes you won't know everything this side of heaven. Are you okay with that? Because it takes spiritual maturity to say, we don't put God in a box. Right? Nobody puts baby in a corner. Nobody puts God in a box. We may not know everything this side of heaven. And that's okay. We can still learn some incredible lessons. That's exactly what happens in the scriptures today. You may remember last week we dropped in on Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And today we're going to go back there. Only this time it's not a social call. This time it's no, who party, make the meal, let's have some fun times. And talk. No, no, no. The mood is drastically different. Go ahead and open your Bible to John chapter 11. Pull up your favorite Bible app. I highly recommend you follow along because this is probably the most scripture we're ever going to look at. We're going to go verse by verse through 44 verses. We're going to be in John chapter 11. I'm going to read from the CSB today. I love this translation. It's very literal, very conservative. Remember, when interpreting scriptures, always start inward. Let God have a chance to say what you think he says, meaning plain, simple English. Then from there, you can always work your way out if you need to, Okay. Here we go. Starting in verse 1, he says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus, from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister, Martha. Mary was the one who anointed Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Don't miss that. Okay, that's important. 
Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he immediately left the town he was in, and he raced back to heal him. <clears throat> no. No. But be honest. That's what a lot of us think he should have done. We do that today, don't we? Well, you should have done this. You should have done There's something bigger happening here. That is not what happened. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. I bet that blew people's minds. Then after that, he said to his disciples, now let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples said, just now the Jews tried to stone you. And you're going to go back there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered. If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not with him. He said this, and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. All right, pause there, because we need to look at the word sleep here. We understand what this is, but back then, they weren't under, this was kind of a, a, a new euphemism. And in the New Testament, we hear it all the time. This is a, a, a way of saying somebody has died, and Paul uses it later in 1 Corinthians. You may remember that famous verse, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye. So right here, he is meaning death, but obviously the disciples didn't get it. Yeah, I love the disciples because I feel like they're just like me and you. You know what I'm saying? Keep going, verse 12. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll get well. This is great. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. There we go. But they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died, guys. He's dead. He's dead, Jim. Right? This is... He's dead, and he, he has to be perfectly plain with him. And then I love this next verse 15. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe, but come, let's go to him. And then Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go too so that we may die with him. It's the weirdest thing. He's like, why? Where, you ever have that one friend that doesn't quite know what to say? <laughs> or they, they make a comment, and you're just like, Really? This, this is kind of how I feel about that. And you know, Jesus and the other disciples were like, what? You want to go die? No, no, it's not about that. I'm so glad Jesus is patient with us. Aren't you? I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on me. And he's just probably thinking, guys, we're going to go, just follow me. Just, we're going to do this. Okay, even when we find ourselves having to wait on God, his timing, don't miss this, is teaching us a lesson. There is something huge going on. In fact, that's our first lesson. As believers... When you find yourself in times of waiting or times of doubt or you find yourself asking why God, interpret your circumstances by the love of Christ, okay, rather than trying to interpret Christ's love by your circumstances. Does that make sense? See, we get this backwards, right? So Potter's hand, you can take your mask down. You don't have to be anything. We can be vulnerable here. We do this all the time. We let our circumstances dictate, oh, God must be displeased with me now. All this bad stuff's happening. Fire alarm's going off. God hates Potter's hand. <laughs> right? We, we look at this. This is what we do. The mistake we make is thinking, if Christ really loved me, then he would do this. Or he would prevent that from happening in my life. True? Nod your head if you're with me. You know people like that. You know people who have made judgments saying, if you just get that sin out of her life, she, she would be healthy. They, their marriage, if they would just, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's, we're so quick to pass judgment, and we're like, God doesn't love them right now because there's, this, there's this, this gut instinct we have. that The problem with that, that's letting Christ's love for us be dictated by our circumstances. And that is not good. Don't fall into the trap. The enemy is going to use that to discourage you. Our job is to view everything through the love of Christ. His love does not change for you. He is a good God. We sing about it. That third song is awesome. Even when there are people hurting, God is still good. Even when we lost our baby, God is still good. Even when we struggle to make a mortgage payment, God is still good. Do you believe that? This is what mature Christianity is about. We don't let our circumstances dictate Christ's love for us. I'm going to view my circumstances through the lens of how awesome God is and that he is good. Keep reading. Verse 17. When Jesus arrived... He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, a little less. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. 
And as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Remember, that's where we found her last time, right? Wasn't Martha the one flitting about doing all this stuff and worried? And where was Mary? Seated at the feet of Jesus. Then Martha said to Jesus, oh, here it is, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mm. I might have said the same thing, guys. In my grief, I know you could prevent this. Why didn't you? If you'd have just been here. I know better about your timing, Lord. And you dropped the ball. We don't say that with our voice. She was brave enough to kind of say it in a sentence there that now lives 2,000 years later. Remember, Lazarus has been dead four days. There's no doubt he's dead. In fact, the Bible reveals that the family members and friends have now already gathered around them trying to help them through their grief. But this passage is so cool because there's so, it's intrigued me. And honestly, it, on the surface, it has baffled me for years because there's hidden gold. You ready for some truth grenades? This, this, is so, I lo, this is so fascinating to me. Have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't rush off to Bethany? As soon as he heard his friend was sick. This is the one he loves, right? You got John and you got Lazarus, the, the disciples. And these are the ones that he loved. Did he seriously wait four more days? Why on earth did he wait so long to take action? Because let's be honest, by human standards, that seems kind of cold, right? I'm just saying the, the quiet part out loud. You know somebody's hurting. You know they need help. We know, we all know you can do something about it. And yet, you hung out for two more days. And my flesh says, what is your problem? I can't believe how chill he is with his schedule. We're not that far. He could have, he could we know that, right? So why? There's something going on, guys. Could it be, as is always the case, God has a far greater plan at work? And even his close friends? Even his followers don't always get that. There is something so incredible. There's something so... God, don't miss this, because some of you are in the same situation right now. You don't understand God's timing. You don't understand what God's doing with your job. You don't understand what God's doing with your son. God, where are you in all of this? Why? There's a hidden gem right here. Do you know what Lazarus actually means in Hebrew? It means, my God will help. My God will help. And this story right here is about to totally justify that name. When news about Lazarus' sickness reaches Jesus, he decides to stay put for two more days. When he finally arrives at Bethany, which in Hebrew means house of the poor, it's been four days that Lazarus has died. Martha comes up to him and says, hey, where were you? You could have been here. If you'd come on time, Lazarus would be alive. And when reading this story, I think most people miss something really important that makes this whole thing make more sense. There's a, there's a lady named Helen Roberts who's an Israeli and Hebrew cultural expert. She reminds us this. She says, in ancient times, many Jews believed that right after death, your soul would literally hover over the body for a period of three days. This is called the period of Shemira. Okay, that's the Hebrew word. And it literally means the watching or the guarding. Now, I want you to put this in context of what's happening, okay? So according to the Jewish religious mindset there, there's a ritual. They're watching over the body of the deceased person. And the time of death until burial is this time, according to the Talmud, where the body, the soul is confused and a little lost. And so it hovers near the body, kind of looking around like, what do we do now? Because we haven't been interred. We haven't been properly buried. We don't know what's happening. And so they think that the soul is lost, so it hovers over it. So they bring in a shomer or a shomeret, depending on male or female, to literally be a guardian, to read scriptures about death, to pray, to fast, to be a guardian, to keep rodents from going to the deceased body. And they're these guardians, and they are trying to help this soul move on from the departed, and they're trying to, to give comfort, and they're meditating, and, and it's a time for healing for, for the people who are guarding, for the family, but also to protect this body. And what I've learned this week that I think was so fascinating, this concept is still practiced by some Jews. And they even take it a step further. You actually, it was an honor to be chosen to be a shomer or a shomeret, a guardian. But when you do it and you sit in that shamira room, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't smoke, <laughs> you can't do anything. You know why? Because they feel it is out of respect for the dead. They can no longer do those things, that it's an insult to them. So out of their love for them, they abstain. 
We could learn something there about respect. So these days are called the three days of the resurrection. Remember that, okay? When you know all this cultural tradition, this is going to make even more sense to us. Now things are becoming clear because Jesus' timing is not an accident. It wasn't him being lazy. He wasn't just being really lackadaisical with a schedule. I'll get there when I get there. Woo, peace. He had a reason. This is showing so vividly the power of his resurrection and that it's not limited to just the three days that the body hovers. So when he waits an additional fourth day, he is demonstrating his authority over death and the grave. He is showing his power. Now, knowing that, waiting those three days and then saying to top it off, I'm going to wait a fourth day. I'm going to show up. And then he drops this truth grenade, the mother of all truth grenades. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not die. Even if they die, they will live again, right? This is, this is so huge. We have to remember the Jewishness of the, of the Savior, the Jewishness of the culture, the times that they live. When we overlook that reality, it, it, we don't understand the New Testament and all of its glory and its richness. So that's the next lesson for, for us. Jesus' friends would have to trust him for the timing as well as the outcome. Y'all need to write that one down. I'll tell you why. I talked to somebody just this morning, a dear friend. Everybody that's seen these notes when we were prepping this said, oh my goodness, we're totally fine with trusting him for this. We trust him for the outcome. We trust him for salvation, right? We trust him he's going to take us with him to glory. We trust him he's going to save our kids. We trust all this. But if we're honest, we have trouble with that one. God's timing, don't we? We have trouble with his timing. <laughs> God, listen, I, your outcome is killer. I get that. But I'm telling you what, you and I both know that only I know when you need to do these things. We don't say that with our voice, but we say it with our heart. We say it when we get a little miffed with God, when he doesn't do what we think he should do in the time we think he should do it. Don't we? God, I am ready to be married. If you don't bring that girl to me, Mm -mm -mm. Your timing is off. God, I'm ready for that pay raise. If you don't bring me that pay raise, that your timing is, don't you know I have needs? I mean, we, we do this all the time. We love to trust God with the outcome, but we struggle with trusting him for the time. Guys, this is so good. This isn't a lesson just for them. This is for us. So many times we say, God, we both know what you need to do, but if you just back up and just turn this one over to me, I know when you need to do it. And as hard as it is to digest what I'm about to say, it's still true. God's ways are not always your ways. They're not. They're not my ways. God's ways are different. I love how David Jeremiah put it. He says, sometimes God is asking his followers to walk by a different light source. To walk by a different light source than our own limited view. We've got our little candle beep, 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 walking down the road. See, oh, that's, oh, that's nice. And God has his massive searchlight. Woo-hoo! He sees everything. Here we are, fumbling in the dark, going, <laughs> you don't quite get it, Lord. This is the timing that needs to happen. This is so powerful. There's a great, great uh, uh, meme that went around years ago. It's brilliant. It's funny. And it says this. It says, it sees two fleas, and they're looking at this beautiful sunrise, and they're having a great time, and they're just thinking and basking in the glory of it. But when you pull back and look at it from our point of view, it's totally different. We see how they are really viewing these things. Wow, this is amazing. And it's so true when we look at these things. It sums it up perfectly. There are times where things that you are seeing aren't really what is happening. We see things differently. All right, keep reading. Martha says this, verse 22. Yet even now... I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said this, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back in. She called her sister Mary, saying in private, uh, I think the teacher's calling for you. Let's go out here. As soon as Mary heard this, she get up quickly. She goes to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village. He was still outside in the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. So they followed her, thinking she was going to the tomb 
to cry some more there. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and she told him, here it is, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have, have we heard this before? Both sisters saying the same thing. Notice Jesus' reaction. When he saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was troubled. Where have you put him? Lord, they said, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews seeing this said, look how he loved him. Now there's something so beautiful happening here. When you see Jesus, he was deeply moved in his spirit. By the way, when you read that, you know what the literal translation means? It means he shook with emotion. Have you ever cried so hard that you feel racked with grief and pain? Where you just, it's almost inconsolable. It's just that body racking. That's the word, that's the emotion that's conveyed here. He is shaking with emotion. And when Jesus saw the emotion and the fear, the tears from Mary and the friends, he identified with their sorrow. It's beautiful. He identified, not just physically, but emotionally. He entered into their pain. Do you catch this? This is what's so awesome about our Savior. He's not some aloof God, some Gandalf in the sky with a beard. And, oh, they have some pain. He enters. And no other faith would even dare try to copy this because they can't. No other faith even attempts this. And they certainly don't attempt to do what Jesus is about to do. Oh, here we go. Keep reading. But some of them said, hey, wait a minute. Couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Right? Here we go. Here's the whispers. Here's a, hey, isn't this the guy who did all that? Oh, his power has limits. He's not a master Jedi. He's just a Padawan learner. No, no, look, the whisper, the judge, we do this. Can't this guy do, what's his problem, right? Keep going. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone now was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. All right, pause right here. There's so, there's so, so much gold here. Something happened here that is so fascinating. Here's the question again, why? Have you ever wondered why he wanted someone else to move the stone? You know, I never really pondered this, and then I was, I, was, I was studying this again this week, looking through this passage, like, why didn't he move it? If he has the power to raise the dead, then surely moving a stone is not really that hard, right? If he could do this, then he could be like Obi-Wan Kenobi and go, oh, and move the stone, Right? I'm speaking the truth. We absolutely can. So why didn't he? Why didn't he move this? Guys, there is some go I love this. This, this is so perhaps the lesson right here hiding with this insignificant, seemingly simple act is that he is wanting someone else to take away the stone because he's demonstrating human obedience often has a place in God's supernatural work. Your obedience often has a place in your life when you follow Christ. All right, go deeper. Apply this to your life. What is your stone that God is asking you to roll away so that he can do a miracle? What is your stone? You know what it is. Is it doubt? That the stone God said, you need to roll that aside. I'm going to come in and I'm going to do a work, a miracle work, but I need you to be obedient. Is it fear? Is it bitterness? You need to roll away the stone of bitterness? Unforgiveness? Is it hypocrisy? What stone is holding you back from God breathing? When you go to share your faith with, with, uh, with other people, how you believe in the Lord, is it a stone of fear or prejudice or apathy? What is your stone that God is asking you to roll away so he can perform the miracle and raise the dead in your world? What a powerful question for us. He's not done. Keep reading. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Don't forget that. Don't forget those words, see the glory of God, okay? So they did it. Verse 41 says they did the unthinkable. They rolled away the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they 
may believe you sent me. Did you catch that? This is unbelievable. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, I love this, unwrap him and let him go. Y'all, this is so good. When Jesus shouted with a loud voice, this wasn't just for Lazarus. This is for the benefit of those who had gathered. Namely, the Jews, the ones who were right there. We heard this. Why? Because he said, so that they may believe that you sent me. So when Jesus shouted and cried out with a loud voice, I looked at the Greek words for this here. This actually conveys the meaning that Jesus was literally shouting his divine authority. Oh, isn't that good? He was literally shouting, I am. And I love that. And while we're talking about the original context here in the Greek, if you want to hear something pretty cool, the Greek words for come out or come forth are so much better in the original than the English. Our English is so lame compared to what the actual text is trying to convey. When he says come out, the actual best translation is get out of there now. Man, that changes the whole power for me. Lazarus, get out of there. Come on out. I wonder if perhaps... If he hadn't just used Lazarus' name, if he hadn't said it, if all the graves would have opened up and let him come out. Because that's the power Christ has. When he speaks those words, Lazarus, come out. He is shouting his divine authority, saying, it is time for you to get out of there. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite our band back up, and I'm going to ask you a couple questions here. I want to leave you with your challenge. I think one of the reasons that I love this story so much is it reminds me to trust not only in God's power, but to trust his timing. And I have a harder time trusting his timing when situations seem hopeless, or when we doubt, or when we ask this question right here. Why? Why, God? Why this? Why didn't this happen? Or why did this happen in this time frame? This story tells me Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And because of him, my darkest moments and your darkest moments, because of him, your doubts, your fears can all be testimonies of God's glory. Do you remember this? Why is this happening? So that you would see the glory of God. So I want you to take a minute and think about the struggle that's running through your mind right now. The thing you've been wrestling with. Is it a doubt? Is it a fear? Is it a, a hurdle? Is there something going on in your life? What is it? Do you believe that Jesus still has the power to speak life? into your world, those dead areas, and breathe that life into it? If so, what area of your life do you need to ask Jesus to speak life into today? If you're new here, what we like to do is we like to finish with a song. It's a beautiful time, just a very sweet time to me. It's the highlight of the day. We stand, we worship, we sing. If you want to come, the altar will be open. You're welcome to pray for a minute or two. No one will bother you. But this is our chance to respond to how God's spoken to us. How is his word spoken? How is the actively singing and worship spoken to you? How is offering your tithes and offerings as a thank you back to the Lord? How has that affected you? These last 50 minutes have been leading to this moment. What area of your life do you need Jesus to speak life into? Let me pray for us. Father, in these next few moments, I pray that you would not only speak to us, that you would breathe new life that you would resurrect tired bones, that you would roll stones away or point to us if we have an obedience act we need to do, Lord, I pray you would highlight it and that we would be obedient and bold and follow you and do what you're asking us to do. May we be found obedient and faithful in your sight. Nothing else matters, Lord. We want to serve you with our whole heart. Thank you for meeting us through your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.